Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I am Tokwa Ulufon. I'm a senior analyst at Forrester. I cover zero trust, detail identity, money detection and response, and e-signature. Prior to this, I used to be an offensive security specialist, and I also led security at a semiconductor firm globally. Today, we're going to be addressing how visibility is an effective way to address today's threat landscape. And we all know that technology and the cybersecurity ecosystem has changed in recent years, faster than any of us could have anticipated. And in all of this, we need to be able to make better and faster decisions. We're gonna be talking about how visibility enables us to make those decisions, and also a practical example of how visibility and where visibility matters is, a, is, a, is an essential tool in dealing with um, cybersecurity threats. A run through of the agenda is again, the going to be the technology and threat landscape. We're gonna be talking about how you can use zero trust to reduce cyber risk. And also how it is very important to listen to how the machines we rely on to get our jobs done, rely on for our daily lives and to basically keep things ru running. How it is important to listen to them so we can take better decisions. First of all, we're gonna talk about the trends shaping today's technology and how they in turn shape the threat landscape. We all know how rapidly technology has evolved in recent years. There's remote work, there's cloud computing, there's AI, and a lot of people think AI, they think chat, GPT, or other forms of generative AI, but it's not just that. The way we carry out day-to-day -day tasks, the way we unlock our phones, there are bits of AI embedded into every facet of our lives. We just become used to it and it fades into the background. This explosion and evolution of technology has changed the way we need to think about cyber risk because with more technology comes more risk. And how we deal with the risk, we cannot keep doing the same thing we have been doing for years because threat actors move very fast. They're very innovative. They spend a lot of time researching and they always find ways to breach our systems. It's also an uneven playing field and they have an asymmetric advantage because that's their day-to-day -day job. Security is often just a part of what we're trying to do. Speaking of technology trends, remote and hybrid work models are firmly entrenched in a work culture. Almost every company offers some form of this today. According to Forrester Research, before COVID-19, work delivered from corporate headquarters was at 49%. This number reduced to 21% in 2022. On the flip side, the number of people delivering work from home went from 2% to 30% according to the same research. Remote work is here. It is embedded. We do not expect it to go anywhere. And we do not want to make the mistake we often make as security professionals by assuming it's a fad that's just going to go away. That's the same thing some of us said about the cloud. We all know how that went. We do not want to do the same thing. We want to be ready because for the longest time, cloud vulnerabilities were very easy to exploit simply because we weren't prepared for it. And I say this as someone who used to work in offensive security. You will be surprised the number of the kinds of vulnerabilities you are able to exploit because a lot of security leaders were copying and pasting existing models into their systems. That seems a lot like what is happening today. And we want to reverse that trend because we do not want the threat actors to consistently have that asymmetric advantage they currently have. Cybercrime is mainstream. A few years ago, a breach makes the news and people talk about it for days. But right now, it's just another thing that happens. Part of this is because as human beings, we tend to get desensitized. But also, threat actors are very innovative, as I've mentioned earlier. I'm going to talk about two things, ransomware and phishing. With ransomware, before, you needed to have deep technical competence to deploy a ransomware attack. Sometimes you had to write your own ransomware. You had to understand the systems. You had to carry out extensive reconnaissance and maybe spend weeks or months embedded in your target systems to effectively deploy ransomware. Right now, you can deploy ransomware at the click of a button. 
You don't even need to go into the dark web to find it. There are telegram groups that will solve this problem for you. You simply send a message, make a transfer, and you're able to deploy a ransom attack. This is because cyber criminals collaborate very effectively. They're willing to share information and they help each other grow, much like how a lot of companies claim to behave. The next bit is a phishing attack. Phishing attack required you to, you know, write a phishing website, figure out ways to emulate the target's website, and then deploy it in the hopes that someone will click it. Right now, all you need again is to click a button. It's like ordering something online. The same way you order groceries or you order food or you order a cab is the same way you can order a phishing or ransom attack. All of this is driven by impressive collaboration by threat actors. The economy is growing, their standardized offerings, their managed services, and this will only become more effective because as tools like AI make it, be- make it easier to write more convincing and better efficient emails and to also deploy tools at scale, they will take advantage of this and be able to expand their services, much like a business. There is also the geopolitical factor. Until recently in certain regions, it wasn't so much of an issue. But right now, where you carry out your business operations is a very important thing for security leaders to consider because manufacturing and engineering companies are top targets to state actors, organized criminals, and opportunistic hackers. People will buy IP and their marketplaces for them, as mentioned earlier. There are standardized offerings that will even assess the value of your IP and the reputation scores of the sellers. It is a very lucrative business. It is very important that security leaders, when creating their threat models, are able to contextualize this and make the right decisions. With all of this, we cannot rely on previous risk management methodologies. We've always had a standard parameter, you know, the internal network, everything in there is presumed safe. And we have the external network, which is where all the big bad things happen. And a lot of the time, risk management efforts are focused on the external network. The problem today is there isn't really an external network. Workforces are globally distributed. So it's not so much that the old-fashioned model of uh, a security perimeter is bad. It's just no longer fit for purpose. Because I always say, if you have a VPN that 4,000 people are using, what you have is a public network in disguise because there is a significant chance someone is going to compromise one of 4,000 people. I say this because that used to be my job until recently. I used to work in offensive security, and a lot of the time, I'm not trying to hack into your VPN because that is too much work. I'm trying to steal one employee's credentials, and that is surprisingly easy. We're just giving rise to what we know as zero trust, and I'm going to go further into what zero trust means and how we can use it to handle the security problems of today. There are a number of factors that made zero trust reality. First of all is cloud adoption. If everyone is working remotely, you need a way to control access to the resources they need to deliver their work. And that's where cloud computing comes in. Distributed working means you cannot really be deploying VPNs and sending laptops to people every single time you're on board there. It slows things down. Also, a lot of vendors have been able to deliver on the Zero Trust promise. There are different components of Zero Trust. And vendors today have stepped up to, the, uh, to customer demand because a lot of, for a long time, it was, you know, it was an ideal. It was some sort of utopia. But a lot of tools today are making this possible. There's also been a demand for agile just-in-time security. I'm going to paint a picture a lot of us would have been familiar with if you've worked for more than a few years. To get approval for anything, You have to send an email to your manager, you sign it off, you get it back. If you're in different time zones, you've lost two working days because you have to work within those time zones. All of this created a need for effective identity and access management, effective permission control that handled things in context which improved automation. And finally, there's been a series of government approvals that have made zero trust a very topical subject for better or for worse, because a lot of vendors have begun to slap zero trust on everything, which is not necessarily a good thing 
because customers struggle to figure out what to buy, which is why it's very important to look at the pillars of zero trust, look at the core things you're trying to focus on and build your security around that. I'm going to go further into how visibility is essential in all of this. Before I go into what zero trust means or how zero trust helps us, we're going to focus on the core concepts. Continuous access mediation. That's essentially it. We have access to resources. We're not trying to protect servers. We always tend to forget that. We're trying to protect the data on those machines. And zero trust enables you mediate, control, and grant that access. The first principle is all entities are untrusted by default. The second principle is constant security monitoring, which we're going to go in depth into today. And finally, least privileged access. I'm going to use a popular analogy, that of a house. Without zero trust, once you get into the house, you have access to all of the rooms and no one knows what you're doing in those rooms. However, with zero trust, you first of all need to prove you, you, you deserve access to the house. You are granted it. And then for every room, you need to demonstrate you in fact to have access to that room and you are who you say you are. And someone, a guard, follows you into each room every single time. That is zero trust. That way, you do only exactly what you need to do. You have the permissions required to do only what you need to do, which reduces the impact if your credentials are breached. As opposed to you breach one person's VPN credentials, you have access to the entire network. The reality of cloud computing made that model obsolete because you really do not want the threat actor to have access to your entire cloud environment. I know what I have done with access to entire cloud environments. And this is me, it legitimates and person that is masquerading as a threat actor. A proper threat actor is going to wreak havoc in your environment and you do not want that to happen. With all of this, you need data because the only way you can know people should, people have access to something or you can control the access is if you know what they should be doing and this is with information. You need data to drive those insights. You need data to drive your visibility and analytics. You need data to drive automation and orchestration because the only way you can mediate access is if you know what you're mediating. And as I always say, this starts with the packets because before information leaves the system, something has been done to it. It's being sent somewhere. That data contains information that needs to be acted on. You need to see it. You need to be able to take decisions on it. The same way the destination takes the decisions on it. And the best time to see it, it's while it's being transmitted. Because if you're looking at information after the, past, after the fact, you're looking into the past. The problem with looking into the past is the threat has already happened. The vulnerability has been exploited. The threat actor has left your environment. You're carrying out an investigation. You want to be able to prevent threats before they happen. Because that way, you have fewer problems. It's really difficult to ensure a threat actor has left your environment. As such, it is in your best interest to prevent them from getting in and embedding themselves. That's why I say computers are chatty and you should listen to them. You should listen to them before the information is sent. You should listen to them while the information is in transit. That's where you get information at two critical points in the communication life cycle. You monitor, you capture, you analyze so that you can take better decisions. But to do this, you need to break up silos. The problem with silos is they are really hard to get rid of. A lot of businesses have their shadow IT. We don't like to admit it, but shadow IT is never really going to go away because technology is hard, security is difficult, and no one really likes us. So a lot of the time, people will find workarounds. The problem with that is the organization evolves into different silos, and you have visibility into slivers of your organization, but you do not have visibility over everything. The problem with that is you lose the ability to make good decisions. On the flip side, threat actors are very good at breaking up silos, because one of the first things you learn is to pivot. You learn how to move between the cloud environment and premise. You learn how to move between networks, segmented networks and VLANs. They get the visibility, but you do not because you have a business to run and you're not a criminal. Unfortunately, that is their business. The second issue is encryption makes it difficult to see what is going on. Encryption is fantastic. 
it's a very brilliant technology because it provides us the confidentiality we need, which is an essential part of the CIA trial that we're all familiar with, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Encryption really enables the first bit. The problem with encryption is threat actors also know how to use encryption. As such, it becomes a lot more difficult to see what is going on, which is why technologies like deep packet inspection take you from opaque to transparent without sacrificing your security. Like most good technologies, deep packet inspection is very difficult. And a lot of vendors will say they do it, but they do not provide the right visibility. Some of them do it only on the cloud. Some of them do it only on premise. Threat actors, on the other hand, are very good at finding visibility across your environment. As such, you need this packet inspection that provides you the north, south, west, east visibility that you need to be truly effective. That way, you're not siloed to on-prem or the cloud, but you can see everything in between. And as such, when the traffic is moving between these environments, you can see what is going on. You can identify problems before they grow and metastasize, and you can stop them in their tracks. Again, DPI is not enough. It is essential, but it is not good enough because as encryption gets better, DPI becomes a lot more difficult, which is why we need to look at how information is transmitted. Before anything happens to data, it's plain text, you do not encrypt it. So capturing the data before it leaves the machine on the network and is encrypted, which it should be, by the way, is a very effective way to deal with that problem without making complex workarounds. Because there are ways around it, but a lot of them are clunky and inefficient. And some of them require you to sacrifice your security. You also do not want to complexify your IT asset management landscape because that's one of the biggest commonalities we have seen in breaches. The biggest challenge a lot of security leaders face is the complexity of the IT systems. So you always want to re reduce that. As such, you do not want to get visibility after it has left its source and have to implement workarounds. You want to get data before. You want to capture data before it is encrypted so that you can reduce complexity and reduce the number of workarounds you have to do. You can also make decisions before it gets on the network because you never really know who's listening. So while you may be able to capture it, who knows what threat actors also have DPI? Who knows what payloads they may have encrypted or modified? You want to be able to make all these decisions as quickly as possible, because again, time is of the essence. They move fast, you need to move faster. You do not want to be playing catch up because you're always going to be a step behind. We've talked a lot about visibility and how it enables you to get zero trust on how it builds a security ecosystem. And while I talk about zero trust a lot, we need to focus on the core premise. Visibility is important. If you choose not to go with zero trust, it is still very important to have the visibility you need to make better decisions. I'm going to paint a story. It's a story a lot of us may have been familiar with because it is fairly common. We have a company, this company, we're gonna call it Aperos. Aperos has a developer called Jamie. Jamie is a very, very brilliant developer. And you know they work on mobile apps and uh, web applications. The web applications make your company a lot of money. Unfortunately, Jamie is not too security minded because they didn't get the right developer training. In addition, they have a lot of pressure. So security becomes deprioritized because they're such a brilliant developer, they keep getting more work. As such, they accidentally check in a configuration file that also contains API keys. Now, a lot of us would think API keys and see that they're just limited to the web application. So while it's bad, it may not necessarily be the worst thing in the world. However, these API keys gives people access to your email server. As such, when they're checked in, you did not see it. You did not have visibility, and Jamie has made a development mistake. You have also made a mistake because you did not see it. A threat actor is evaluating your systems and they find these keys in your GitHub repository. You still do not know because you did not have visibility. This threat actor uses those keys to access your container systems. Now, every single thing you dockerize and deploy to the cloud, the threat actor also has access to. 
And then they use those keys to send the phishing emails. This phishing email, Jamie clicks on it because, hey, it came from the company and all your phishing training focuses on the fact that you should check the source of the email. All the checks are passed because in reality, it was sent from your systems. Jamie clicks the link. The threat actor gains access to your cloud systems using Jamie's system because they deployed malware on it. Now they have a backdoor. Calling it malware is even a bit of a stretch because what they used was PowerShell. So therefore, it's not really malware because it's a legitimate system that Jamie uses. You did not have visibility. You did not see Jamie's unusual login and activity patterns because Jamie works in the GMT time zone. However, they're operating in Pacific time. That is incredibly unusual. These cloud systems also contain your applications, applications that are used by your employees, but are used by everyone in your business. The threat actor now has access to those apps. Your customers also use those apps. Unfortunately for you, you work in a regulated industry with strict data protection regulations, and you're looking to expand into the European region, which also has very strict regulations. All of this is creating problems you are still not aware of, by the way, because you do not have visibility. You've not seen what was happening in the cloud. You've not seen what was happening in your containers. You didn't see what happened on Jamie's system. You also haven't noticed that Jamie has been working from two countries at once at the same time, which is impossible because no one can be in two places at the same time. All of this is still happening because you have no visibility. The threat actor has compromised all your applications. You may think something is wrong and you check the logs. However, the threat actor is very good at editing logs because logs are mutable. Finally, the threat actor has access to your APIs. They're able to control and deploy updates to your mobile applications. Now, every single customer you have ever had and will ever have is in control of the threat actor because you do not see what was going on in your environment. If you had visibility, none of this would have happened. You would have seen the data before it left Jamie's system. You would have seen it in transit. You would have seen the keys in unusual locations if you were checking and assessing your attack surface. But you did not do monitoring, which is essential to zero trust. You did not mediate access because Jamie had access to more than they should. Jamie is deploying things, but you didn't see anything. If you had captured and listened to it, the story would have been different. It would have stopped at Jamie or the containers. It definitely would not have gotten to your APIs, which is why it is essential to ensure you invest in visibility to make the right decisions and secure your um, security system, your technology systems. Thank you.